Hi, this is Amr Abdigawad and we're going to speak today about osteodosteoma. What are the objectives of this lecture? First, we'd like to describe the pathology of osteodosteoma, and then we're going to speak about the clinical picture and imaging uh, of osteodosteoma in children. This includes x-ray, CT, bone scan, and MRI. And then we're going to speak about the treatment options of osteodosteoma in children. A good source that you can use is this book written by myself and Dr. Naga. What is the pathology in osteodosteoma? Osteodosteoma is a benign bone forming tumor. What does this mean? It means it's benign, it's not malignant, and it's bone forming lesion. Uh, as we're going to see in different lectures, uh, there's other lesions of the bone that forms bone or forms cartilage uh, or forms fibrous tissue. So osteodosteoma is benign bone forming, it's composed of bone. Uh, and it's composed of two areas, nidus and reactive zone. What is the nidus? Nidus is a woven bone, an area of a woven bone that means it's an irregular bone, uh, irregular bone trabeculae connected to each other uh, in, in a loose fibrovascular stroma. And this nidus is surrounded by reactive area of thickened bone uh, from the host bone. So if this nidus of uh, irregular bone that is uh, interconnected together uh, forms in the tibia, for example, or in the proximal femur, that host bone, the tibia or the proximal femur, is going to surround that nidus with an area of thickened bone as a reaction to this nidus. So it's a benign bone-forming lesion and is composed of a nidus, which is a woven bone, irregular, um, trabeculae, uh, immature bone, and this nidus, uh, the host bone, that the bone that is this nidus uh, lies in, is going to surround that nidus with the reactive area of thickened bone, as we're going to see in the x-rays. Osteodosteoma is a disease of young uh, age. It happens in the second and third decades of life. That's why you can see them in children. Uh, they are more common in male than female in a ratio of 2 to 1. Uh, they commonly affect uh, the diaphysis of long bone. Uh, so um, usually they can uh, affect uh, the diaphysis of the tibia, as we're going to see in the uh, x-rays. Uh, and uh, they sometimes affect the spine. And they if they affect the spine, usually they present with painful scoliosis, as we're going to see also. So what is the clinical presentation of osteodosteoma? Uh, pain. Pain is the most important clinical presentation of osteodosteoma. What is the character of this pain? First, it's increased at night when there is congestion of the extremity. Uh, so when you have a child, for example, complaining of uh, lower leg pain that uh, increases at night, think in osteodosteoma. This pain is relieved by uh, non-steroidal. Uh, characteristically, it was said it's it, it is relieved by aspirin, but it's actually relieved by all non-steroidal uh, because the theory of the pain on osteodosteoma, it's uh, due to increased prostaglandin. So uh, when you have any of the non-steroidal, that will inhibit the prostaglandin production and will relieve that pain. And um, early, the pain is vague. However, if it increases in severity, it becomes aching in character. And the very characteristic of this pain, it's not relieved by rest. So if the child rests uh, the extremity, the pain is not going to be relieved. Uh, this is the characteristic of pain in osteodosteoma. So let's describe the x-ray picture uh, of osteodosteoma. So you see here, this is an x-ray uh, of an 11-year-old patient presenting with pain in his right lower leg. If you see here the x-ray, in the mid shaft of the tibia, there is an area of reactive zone formation or hyperdense bone. So you don't see the nidus, you don't see the lesion. However, what you see is a dense bone uh, which is surrounding that lesion. So you see this is the normal cortex, for example. This is the normal cortex, for example. This is the normal cortex. But in this area here, that normal cortex becomes so dense. Why? Because you're seeing in the X-ray the reactive zone surrounding the nidus. This is the lateral view of the same patient. So if you see here also the same thing, posterior cortex has reactive zones. So this is the anterior cortex, normal. And this is the posterior cortex. All of a sudden, it became so dense in this area. And if we see here is the uh, close-up view, you can see this area. This is the nidus. This is the radiolucent area and surrounded with all this area of reactive zone. So in the AP view, we saw the reactive zone. In the lateral view, we're able with a very close-up to see the, re uh, the radiolucent area of the nidus. And uh, you can surround, see also here the reactive sclerotic bone around that nidus. 
The CT will show the lesion much better. So this is a CT through the tibia. And you can see here that's the radiolucent area. And you can see it. And then the radiolucent area is surrounded by the dense uh, hypersclerotic bone. And by definition, osteoid osteoma has to be less than 1.5 centimeter because there is a very similar lesion, also benign bone-forming lesion called osteoblastoma. Uh, that uh, goes above 1.5 centimeters. So by definition, osteoma has to be less than 1.5 centimeter. Uh, you can see it better in the CT. So here is in the CT, here is the radiolucent area. Here is the area that has to be less than 1.5 centimeter. The reactive zone goes much more than this. But when we say that osteoma is a, uh, has to be a small lesion, we uh, means that uh, nidus here or the radiolucent area here. So that radiolucent area here has to be less than 1.5 centimeter to be considered osteoma. If it's more than this, it, it will fall into the category of osteoplastoma. Uh, this area is surrounded by dense reactive bone that can go uh, high, um, uh, more proximal and more distal as we saw in the x-rays, uh, and it go much more than the 1.5 centimeter. As we said, osteoma can affect the spine. So uh, this is a, a 10 year old uh, child uh, coming with back pain. X-rays taken showed uh, minimal scoliosis. As you know that scoliosis is usually not a painful condition. So whenever you get a uh, painful scoliosis, think about osteoma. Uh, nothing obvious in the x-ray of the back except, as, I, as we said, that mild scoliosis that the child has. If you see here, that's mild scoliosis. However, if you look to the vertebra closely, you cannot see any obvious lesion. So MRI was done for this patient, and as we see here in the MRI, in the pedicle of L5, there is obvious edema. As we have described before in the uh, pain, we said that osteoid osteoma generates prostaglandin, and that causes uh, inflammation and edema. And it's obvious here in the MRI, you don't see the nidus clearly as, you, as we saw in the CT, but you see obvious edema around the tissue. So we know that there is a lesion here. So in the MRI, uh, in osteoid osteoma, it's usually not uh, very uh, sensitive to detect the lesion however you can see the edema around the lesion itself so CT was done at that level and if, as you can see in the CT here here is the uh, osteolytic lesion so you can see it much clearer here in the CT than the MRI so uh, this is something that you uh, have to keep in mind that osteoid osteoma can be seen much better in the CT than the MRI. So you can see here is the nidus and here is the osteolytic lesion. And as we said, osteolytic lesion by definition has to be less than 15 millimeter to be considered osteoid osteoma. Uh, if it's more than uh, 15 mil to 20 millimeters, it's considered osteoplastoma. So in this case, it was 11 millimeter. And again, we measured the osteolytic lesion, not the dense area around it. So the area dense around it uh, can be much larger. However, the osteolytic osteolytic lesion itself, the nidus should be around less than a 15 uh, millimeter. Another um, imaging modality that can be used to detect uh, osteodosteoma is bone scan. So we said in the x-ray, you will not, mostly in most cases, you won't see the lesion. You will see the sclerosis around the lesion. Uh, in uh, CT, you can better delineate the lesion. In the MRI, you will see the edema. The bone scan will present as hot spot, as you can see here. Uh, so. Um, Osteodosteoma is positive in bone scan as hot spot, and uh, bone scan is one of the sensitive methods to detect osteodosteoma. What is the treatment for osteodosteoma? There is three main lines of treatment, medical treatment or surgical excision or CT-guided uh, radio, radio frequency ablation. Medical treatment depends on the fact that osteodosteoma is self-limiting disease that usually takes about two years. Uh, so the patient can be treated with non-steroidal uh, to decrease the pain. Uh, and uh, usually after about two years, the pain will uh, resolve completely. Uh, the problem that um, not all patients can uh, tolerate uh, the pain for uh, two years, and most patients will require either the second or the third line of treatment. The second line of treatment is surgical excision. And uh, if surgical excision is done, it has to include the whole nidus uh, to provide cure. And usually the patient will describe that immediately post-operative, uh, the pain had completely resolved if the surgeon removed the whole osteoid osteoma. 
the line of treatment that is more common nowadays is the CT guided percutaneous radiofrequency ablation. And this technique is done uh, percutaneously, so uh, there is no open wound. Uh, through a small incision, a uh, probe uh, uh, is introduced into the lesion, and we know that we are in the lesion using a CT. And then uh, radio frequency uh, is going to be introduced uh, through that uh, uh, probe, uh, and uh, this radio frequency is going to uh, cause appellation uh, of the nidus. Uh, it is uh, commonly used now, and again, also, if the uh, intervention radiologist was able to completely uh, uh, remove the lesion using the radiofrequency ablation, uh, the patient will uh, describe complete uh, re resolution of the symptoms immediately post-operative. So this is uh, the CT-guided radiofrequency ablation for uh, the patient that I showed you before, the intervention radiologist. Uh, introduced the probe and then he developed the radio frequency to cause ablation of the lesion uh, and patient was completely uh, symptom free after the procedure. I'd like to mention here that not all lesion is amenable to this line of treatment uh, um, and uh, the surgeon and the radiologist should uh, sit together to decide if this lesion can be safely uh, uh, removed with radio frequency ablation. Uh, because uh, if the lesion is very close to the cord or very close to a blood vessel or a nerve, it may be uh, dangerous to introduce the thermal injury uh, that can cause damage to the nerve or the blood vessel. Uh, in this case, we felt uh, we can uh, safely pr perform uh, the procedure. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to mention that all my videos are for educational purpose only. Please consult your doctor before any decision. Thank you.